Hello, um, my name is Paul DeBolt, and I wanted to thank everybody for uh, participating in our monthly webinar series. Uh, I'm the chair of Venables Government Contracts Group, and joining me on this webinar is James Bolin, who is a partner in the Government Contracts Group as well. Given that we're about six weeks away from the end of the fiscal year, we thought it would be a good time to talk about bid protest strategies for government contractors. Uh, we'll reserve about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send those in. So what are we going to talk about over the next 75 minutes or so? Uh, we're going to talk about a number of different topics that relate to uh, bid protests. We're going to talk about form selection, timeliness, debriefings, uh, the decision to protest or not to protest, task and delivery order protest, as well as uh, whether companies should intervene in a protest if their award is being um, protested. Then finally, if we have time, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned that uh, we've collected over the years based on what we've seen at the GAO, as well as what we've heard from our clients and um, uh, things of that nature. So with regard to form selection, there are three forums that a company can go to to protest an award. There's the agency, the Government Accountability Office, and the United States Court of Federal Claims. Many agencies also have a task and delivery order ombudsman, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but it doesn't really have the formalized procedures that the agency, the GAO, and the Court of Federal Claims do with regard to bid protest, and I think both James and I have had experiences with the task and delivery order ombudsman that um, I guess we're, we're less than satisfactory, I think is how we describe it, yeah. when you know sometimes the ombudsman won't return your call or issue a decision. So uh, those positions seem to be more just for optics rather than actually exercising any um, authority and trying to address concerns of, of disappointed offerers. Most most companies that file a bid protest, they, they protest at the GAO, and the reason is that if you protest at the GAO in a timely manner, you can get an automatic stay, and your company's not going to be in a stronger position than when it gets an automatic stay, because the automatic stay serves to maintain the status quo. Uh, the next few slides give a little bit of history about the GAO. Uh, another good thing about going to the GAO is that under SECA, the GAO has to issue a final decision within 100 days after the protest is filed. Uh, a lot of times companies will file supplemental protest, but except in the rarest of circumstances, all the protests are going to get resolved within 100 days. You know, sometimes you get a panic call from a client that because of the supplemental protest and when it was docketed, it looks like the decision date is going to slip to the right. But except in the rarest of circumstances, the GAO is going to do everything they can to get it, the decision issued within 100 days after the date the um, initial protest was filed. I'm going to skip up to um, slide 10, which provides some statistics from the GAO between 2012 and 2016. Um, you know, I think that over the past number of years, bid protests have been on the rise. Uh, I think this is due in large part to the fact that with budget uncertainty and the budget contracting and with the sequester, that I think people are more worried about what the workflow is going to look like. And so if they're an incumbent, there's certainly an incentive to try to hold on to the work. And if you are a new entrant into the market, you know, you run the risk that there's not going to be a, a new vehicle available for you. And so a lot of times when an agency awards an IDIQ contract, a lot of our clients are hoping to, to just get a contract so that they have a, a hunting license for future work. Because if you don't, if you're not one of those awardees, you know, you could be shut out of a line of work which could uh, significantly impact your bottom line. With regard to, in 2016, there were 2,700 about protests filed. That was up 6% from 2015. 
of the 2,700, the GAO issued 616 decisions. 139 of those were sustained, so that increased the sustain rate to 23%, which was almost double what it was in 2015. Typically, when we talk to clients, you know, we tell them that under the best in, under the best of circumstances, you have about a, a one in five chance of um, winning at the GAO. Uh, the GAO also has a uh, measure that they define as the effectiveness rate, and that's 46%. And that consists of both the sustains as well as those cases where the government's taking corrective action. And then there also has some statistics on ADR, which is outcome prediction, which they use uh, frequently, the success of that, and then hearings. The hearings at the GAO are, are, are rare. Uh, it's typically the exception, not the rule. The good thing is that when the GAO does ask for a hearing, I think the agency's reaction is that things are not going well for them and that they have some things they need to fill out in the record. But by and large, you know, that probably happens in, what do you think, James, maybe one out of every 10 protests, one out of 20? Yeah, I think, I think that it, it's definitely rare. One, one point I would make on, on these uh, GAO bid protest statistics, um, I mean, certainly folks talk a lot about the increasing rise of protests, and, and, and the numbers do bear that out at, at the GAO, at least. And, and right now, we're only talking about the GAO. The Court of Federal Claims is, is roughly around 100 a year, um, um, obviously not, not, not used nearly as frequently as the GAO, which is why we're, we're focusing right now on the GAO. But, but for those of you familiar with, with filing protests at the GAO and the way that the GAO dockets a protest, when, when someone files a supplement to their protest, to add additional arguments to the initial filing, that supplement receives a, a new docket number, uh, a, a point two, a point three, a point four, and, and so on. And, and these statistics that we've just been discussing count supplemental protests. So, uh, and for those of you who have been down this path, it's 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 pretty common to file supplemental protests, and sometimes a lot of supplemental mm -hmm. grounds, uh, depending on how often the record is produced. And so uh, that can drive up the perception of of more protests when when maybe only you know you're, you may be talking about one procurement that's challenged may have uh, three or four uh, protest filings associated with it. And then when you, and then in addition to that, you think about some of these really large IDIQ contract awards where where you have ten or fifteen or twenty protesters file, and if each of those files a supplemental protest or two you now have 60, 70, 80 numbers in the GAO's docketing system are associated with just a single contract award. So I think it's important to keep that in mind when you look at these numbers that uh, sometimes, the, although the, the, the trends seem to go up and down and, and, uh, and, and, and actually right now the protest numbers are still lower than they were in the early 90s, so it's not, we're not at an all-time high. Um, the, the, the way that the GAO tracks these can, can affect those numbers. So we're going to talk about the, the different forms today, and on the next couple of slides, we really do have just a summary comparison of the agency versus the GAO versus the Court of Federal Claims. And as you're walking through whether to file a protest or not, you really are going to want to look at the jurisdictional issues, especially with regard to task orders, where the GAO has task order jurisdiction and the Court of Federal Claims, except in very, very, very limited circumstances, doesn't. Um, you know, with regard to the type of decision you're going to get from the agency, you'll get a thumbs up or thumbs down decision. From the GAO, you're going to get a recommendation of what the agency should do, and certainly the agency is, has the ability to disregard it. If you go to the Court of Federal Claims, you're going to get an order that the agency has to, um, to follow. You know, if again, I think the most the best position you can put yourself in from a company perspective is to get the automatic stay. And so, in most cases, that cuts in favor of going to the, the, the GAO. If you're going to go to the Court of Federal Claims, you're going to have to make the motion to get a temporary restraining order and a preliminary injunction. And that is just a, a lot a higher hurdle to clear uh, than the automatic stay provisions at the GAO. The timeliness requirements at the agency and the GAO are, are, um, are, are, are firm. <laughs> they're, they're hard deadlines. You have a little bit more flexibility with the court. Uh, typically, if you file an agency protest, it's going to get resolved in 35 days. The GAO is going to get resolved in resolved in 100 days. And it's court of federal claims. You know, it's hard to predict when you actually uh, 
get, get a decision. So on the next slide, we have some of the key form selection considerations that companies need to, to factor in. Uh, the scope of administrative record, if you go to the agency, you're not going to get administrative record. You go to the GAO, you will get an administrative record, although the quality of it, the scope of it varies from command to command. Uh, certainly, James and I have had any number of cases where uh, the government has sought to limit uh, the scope of the documents that have been produced. And we actually have one case where there were key documents that were withheld at the GAO level that were ultimately produced at the Court of Federal Claims. And it was, it was shocking to see the documents that were withheld because they were clearly relevant to uh, the issues in, in the protest. On, on that point, Paul, I would, I would add that um, you know, people ask, well, why, why does the administrative record, uh, why is it different at the two? And, and I think the, the, the real issue here is that at the GAO, the administrative record um, that the agency has to produce is, is the relevant records. And it's really self-policing. The agency can decide what they consider relevant to your protest. So what, what happens, and, and as I think happen, has been happening increasingly, is that agencies they, they open up their, their, their procurement file and they decide what's helpful and what's not and, and they'll redact information that they don't think is relevant. And for the most part, the GAO just really defers to what the agency says. I mean, we, you, know, you can challenge it and sometimes uh, our, you know, objections are sustained by the GAO, but, but by and large, GAO allows the agency as a broad latitude to decide what should consist of their own record. And that's, that's a perennial frustration for protesters. At the court, the, the, the rules are, are, are different. It's the administrative record, period. And, and for that reason, uh, the government just produces the file. Uh, no redactions, you know, no, no selection, prior selection of what, you know, what may or may not be relevant. They also get the sense that at the Court of Federal Claims, because DOJ is involved, there's less of the gamesmanship yeah. because they don't have sort of that vested interest in the outcome of the protest. It's just another case. Now, I know that, that Limiting the record is frustrating to, to protesters, but when you intervene, it, it's a benefit because I know anytime we intervene mm -hmm. to protest, you know, the first thing we do is go through the protest, call the agency counsel and say, hey, look, you know, they asked for X, Y, or Z. There's no protest grounds that relate to that. You guys ought to take, you, you guys ought to withhold it. So it really is a two-edged sword because when you're intervening, it really does work to your advantage. But when you're protesting, it can really hamper your ability to uh, to uh, mm -hmm. present present your case. The um, the cost of litigation, obviously, the agency is going to be the cheapest way to go because you're just filing a letter. There's not going to be supplemental filings or comments on the agency report. The GAO is less expensive than the Court of Federal Claims. The Court of Federal Claims has much more formalized uh, pleading requirements and you have hearings and motions and so it can be a little bit more expensive and typically what we see is that unless somebody gets is unhappy with the draw they get at the GAO or unhappy with the GAO's decision, the Court of Federal Claims is not typically their, their first choice. I mean typically they do go to the uh, the GAO first. The next slide really talks about filing the protest and it draws the distinction that the agency and GAO, you really do just file an informal letter and the Court of Federal Claims, you file a complaint so the pleadings are much more, um, pleading requirements are much more rigid and uh, expensive. At the agency, you're not going to have a protective order at the GAO and the Court of Federal Claims, uh, you potentially do. You, you will have protective orders. And I know that the protective order can be very frustrating to clients. And so it's really important to have a good relationship with your outside counsel so that you're comfortable that you're getting a candid assessment of the likelihood of success. Uh, the only document at the GAO that has to be redacted is the initial protest. And, you know, we're seeing more and more of our clients that don't want redactions for subsequent filings because by the time they everything's redacted and agreed to among the parties, there really isn't much left. I mean, it's like going through Hoover's F, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI files. It's just redacted page after redacted page after redacted page. So um, it, it can be frustrating, but... You know, you're just going to have to trust your counsel that they really are trying to get you the information and giving you a candid assessment of the, of the likelihood of, of, of success. 
So the next couple slides deal with, sort of discuss what happens after um, protest is filed at the agency. And again, the agency is going to try to issue a decision in, in 35 days. Um, you know, there's not going to be any discovery. You're, you, the government's not going to provide you with um, documents. It really is just a letter that goes into the agency that the agency decide will issue a decision on. The GAO is different in that the agency has to file an agency report within 30 days after receiving notice of the protest. A lot of times the agency is going to file a motion to dismiss so they don't have to file an AR. If there are concerns with the merits of the protest, a lot of times the agency will take corrective action before they even submit the AR. James and I just did a protest on a pre award protest on overly restrictive specifications and you know, within five to six days after filing the protest, the agency took um, corrective action, so an AR was never filed. You do have the opportunity to request documents. The volume of documents, the quality of the production is going to vary from agency to agency, office to office. And then after the government submits their AR, the agency report, the protester has 10 days to um, provide comments on it or provide any supplemental comments, and then you will get a decision within 100 days. Uh, there's no formal appeal right, but you can file a motion for reconsideration. By and large, those are not successful, except in the rarest of cases. And then if you're not happy with the GAO's decision, you can always go to the, um, the Court of Federal Claims. We've also thrown in a slide on uh, the court, what goes on at the Court of Federal Claims for your information. But given that most people are in front of the GAO, we really are going to focus our discussion on of the GAO today. So what happened, what are the potential outcomes if you file a protest? Well, I think the number one outcome is that probably 54% of the time you're going to lose, right? If the government only, ha if the GAO has a 46% effectiveness rate, in 46% of the cases, there either there is going to be a sustained or some sort of corrective action. So that means 54% 54 of the time you're going to lose. Um, you know, if the agency takes corrective action, that can be a good thing. But a lot of times the corrective action really is just a reevaluation or where they go back and just document the record to support their previous award decision. I mean, when we were preparing for this, James, I was trying to think of the number of times over the last 10 years that a protest actually resulted in a different award. I can only think of two or three that we've experienced, if that. I mean, we've had some where we've gotten a contract, you know, and then the IDIQ scenario, but that where you have a evaluate your procurement and the government goes back and says they got it wrong the first time. I mean, that, that seems to me to be the exception rather than, than the rule. Uh, you could get a decision from the GAO. Again, it's a recommendation, so it's, it's, it's non-binding. They could refrain from exercising options on the contract. They could terminate the contract. They could open the contract to a new competition, issue a solicitation that truly reflects the government's requirement, recommend that an award be made consistent with statute or regulations and whatever um, recommendations they have the um, the ability to make. Uh, the Court of Federal Claims can adjoin award and order binding actions uh, that the GAO can only uh, recommend. So those are some of the potential outcomes. Now, as I mentioned, you, you know the the timelines at the GAO and the agency are 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 very difficult. They're very unforgiving. I mean, you either hit the timelines or you don't. And James is going to talk a little bit about what the timelines are and and um, some of the challenges contractors face in trying to uh, hit those timelines. Yeah. So as, as Paul said, you know, timeliness matters, and and it's it's if you're if you're not aware of the timeliness, then then uh, you know you may you may be really miss out on the opportunity to to even uh, consider doing something about something that you perceive to be. Um, improper in the procurement process. Um, so uh, I'm first going to talk about the pre-award protests, and then we'll shift over to the post-award, which are which are more common. On the pre-award side, and you would, there's really two two broad types. You have challenges to the solicitation itself, or the, the ground rules of the competition, um, or you have a situation where you've already submitted your proposal, and there's a there's a competitive range termination, and your proposal is is rejected. Or, or maybe just your proposal is disqualified for not complying with, with some requirement, but there's still no award. So technically, it's a pre-award protest, although 
it, it, those tend to look more like post-award protests because there's been some sort of evaluation. Uh, but in the general pre-award protest context, when you are challenging a solicitation, you have to file that objection uh, before the closing date for receipt of proposals. That's, that's the hard deadline at, at the GAO, and it's written into the GAO regulation, uh, and the same with, with the agency, if you, if you choose to go directly to the agency. The Court of Federal Claims does not have a timeliness rule, which is interesting. There's no statute of limitations in the, in the, in the statute authorizing protests at the court. However, the, the appellate court has adopted in the famous blue and gold case uh, a, a, a principle which mirrors the GAO rule, which is that you waive your right to protest uh, an objection to the, the solicitation, the ground rules, or just the process in general if you wait until after your proposal is due. The idea behind that, that rule and the thinking is that uh, by submitting your proposal to the agency, uh, you, are, you are essentially conceding that you're okay with, with the ground rules as they're written. You're not, you're not objecting, you're, you're going along with it. And, and, there's a, and the court has recognized a fairness principle that if you're going to submit your proposal and expect the agency to evaluate it, you can't wait until six months later, until after an award decision, to then go back and complain about the terms of the solicitation as being rigged or unfair to the incumbent or some other, some other defect. Um, so uh, the, the problem is, in, in looking at pre-award protests, is that most companies at that point aren't thinking about a challenge to the agency. Right now, you're thinking about doing business with the agency. Right. Um, so you get a solicitation. You want to you want you want to uh, to make a good impression. So I think there's a probably a reluctance among contractors to really scrutinize solicitations to the degree they should um, and consider protesting. But sometimes you you really have no choice. And um, you know I'm going to deviate a little bit here and talk about some of the substance of of, of, of pre-war protests here. So I think it's I think it's it, it's appropriate here. Paul, you mentioned earlier that, that a common ground is unduly restrictive terms of the solicitation. That is, that's a classic reason to challenge a solicitation. And in fact, if, 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 the, if the RFP is written in a way that, that prevents you from participating, then that may really be your only choice. Um, a lot of other common objections that you may have would you know, include improper clauses in a solicitation. Um, um, or the failure to include a mandatory clause that you think would be helpful. Um, I mentioned the blue and gold case, which which created the the timeliness rule at, at the Court of Federal Claims, and that case actually involved the the agency's inclusion of the Service Contract Act clause in in the in the in the solicitation, or, or failure to include the SCA clause. Um, you, you see a lot of pre-award protests challenging uh, improper bundling. Um, ambiguous solicitation provisions, that's another, uh, I think, another big one where you just can't figure out what exactly the agency is saying they want or how they're going to evaluate the proposals. Um, you can challenge uh, an, uh, the evaluation method as being unreasonable, although I would, I would, I would note that uh, it's not, this is not an opportunity for you to disagree with the agency's, uh, the wisdom of their, of their procurement. I mean, if they decide to go fix price and, and you think it should be cost reimbursement, or if they decide that, that price is significantly more important than technical, you're not going to win that. That's, that's, that is not an, an, an aspect of an RFP that you can challenge as being unreasonable, even though, you know, behind the scenes, we can talk about that and say, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, we, we disagree with what the government's doing, but but you know, the court, the GAO, they're not going to review it to that, that level. I'm, so we talk about unreasonable evaluation method. We could be talking about uh, maybe a numbering system, a scoring system that, 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 that just doesn't add up or that, that, that the, the formula is so skewed that it, it, it doesn't achieve what the solicitation says it's trying to achieve. Um, I, I got to tell you, from, like, from my perspective and, and some of the things that we run into after we file post-award protest, I don't know that companies use the pre-award protest enough mm -hmm. because I I think, I mean, you've seen it. I know I've seen it. There have been any number of provisions that after the contract has been awarded, you know, your client comes in and says, oh, that's what that meant. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, well, we thought this control because there was a conflict. And you really do need to address those up front because if you raise them after the fact, you're putting your outside counsel in the position that, oh, we didn't know it was ambiguous until we saw how it was interpreted, which is a tough argument to make. I think one of the strategies on pre-award protests, and I know that James and I both recommend this, is if you don't want to go in and file a GAO GAO protest, I think this one makes a lot of sense for an agency protest because it's really in their interest to ensure that the solicitation is well written, that they're not going to get a post-award protest. And the agency level protest is sort of a private matter. It's just between you and the agency where the GAO is just much more public. And so I think that the pre-award protest is really a a good area to really look hard at following the agency protest. Now, if the agency is unreasonable or, you know, they're not cooperative, then maybe you do want to go the public shaming route. But if you have a good relationship with them, you know, probably the agency level would be the way to go. Yeah, and I would say particularly when it appears that the the, the defect in the solicitation that you're you're challenging could be a mistake. You know, if if, if it includes if it fails to include a clause. And, and actually, I would even back up and say that, that, that the first thing you should try to do is, is, ask, is raise the issue in a Q&A. Correct. You know, point out a problem with the solicitation. See if that prompts the agency to take the corrective action. Um, that's a nice, gentle way to, to get their attention. And if they refuse to answer the question, as, as often, <laughs> oftentimes happens, um, or, or just does not really give any sort of meaningful response, then, then, then you kind of can go to the agency directly um, before uh, – Elevating it to the GAO or even court, if, if that's if that's appropriate. But um, you know, we talk about some of the conversation items that you might have with with your team and looking at these solicitations and things that you should um, just be thinking about when when you receive a, an RFP and are and are thinking about whether there's some problems. Uh, you know, focus on focus on really aspects of it that where you think it may give you a, a, just an unfair disadvantage um, or an unfair advantage to someone else. Um, um, if 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 it looks like it's rigged for someone else, and that's a term that, that people use often. Mm-hmm. If it looks like it's all rigged for the incumbent or some particular vendor, um, you know, give serious thought to exploring whether whether the solicitation is 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 unduly restrictive. Um, you know, for ambiguities, that's certainly something else that you would you would always try to clarify in the Q and A's. Um, uh, I think with any protest, and this probably goes more toward the post award side as well. You 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 want to think about the relationship with the agency and what a, a formal challenge would do before before you you've even submitted your proposal. You, you know, do you want to be known as that company who is who is already complaining and litigating, um, and that and that certainly affects the business. Uh, decision-making process, but but um, it, it all depends on how much you can live with the flaws that you see. Um, but so, kind of reverting back to the timeliness here uh, issue. So, so bottom line is just remember solicitation defects and issues got to be before you submit your proposal. That includes solicitation amendments. Um, if there's an amendment that introduces a flaw, and sometimes there's only a two or three day period to respond to that, you've got two or three days to file a protest. So. The, the, the timeliness can be very short on these pre-award protests. Uh, in, the, in the post-award world, where, where the majority of protests uh, are, uh, you've got the familiar rule at the GAO, the 10-day ten, the ten rule, 10 days after you knew or should have known the, the basis of protests, uh, whichever, whichever is earlier. This is why um, you, you ought to be thinking about uh, long before an award is made, you ought to be thinking about whether this procurement is important enough to your company that it might be one that you would explore protesting if the result does not uh, turn out as you as you hoped. Um, it's it's never a good idea to be thinking about a protest after you know only when you get the the disappointed offeror notice and you think oh gee you know this I'm not happy with this let's maybe let's go find counsel let's let's start talking about whether we should protest. Um, much better to be thinking about it ahead of time. Um, the the um, so the 10 day rule applies for, for both agency and, and GAO protests. Um, the Court of Federal Claims, as we mentioned before, does not have a strict timeliness rule. Um, however, uh, in the post award uh, 
context, there's a there's a, a an equitable doctrine is applied to your protest, and it's essentially the, the court will determine whether or not you, you your your delay in bringing a protest was was prejudicial. Um, I've seen a variety of 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 time between an award decision and the actual protest going to the court. Um, usually it's a couple weeks. Um, uh, in fact, I would say more often than not, your protest of the court is following a, a GAO protest. So the GAO denies your protest, and then within a couple weeks you decide to go to court and bring the protest there. Um, that's fine. You know, two weeks, three weeks. I've I've even taken one after five weeks after a GAO denial, which is pretty long, and and I, I wouldn't advise waiting that long. Uh, it, but it, those determinations are going to be fact specific at the court. It depends how how you know what the procurement is, what the, you know, uh, uh, you know the the status of the award and what's being performed. Um, but it is something to think about. Um, if you do want to go to court, the bottom line is you got to do it. You should be doing it quickly. Um, and, and, and you got to realize too, because I mean, James and I have had this experience where I think we went in within 14 days, 15 days after we got a GAO decision, because there were a number of stakeholders within the client that needed to weigh in on whether to go to the court or not. And lo and behold, you know, the first argument out of the DOJ attorney's mouth was, well, this really isn't that urgent or you really weren't that concerned about being hurt because you waited a whole 14 days before you filed your pleadings. And yeah. they didn't get any traction with the judge, but it was still an argument that we had to address and be prepared to, to deal with it at the initial hearing. But if you can sort of short circuit various arguments or defenses that the government's inevitably going to put up, you know, you're going to put yourself in a better position and also be able to handle the case in a more cost-effective manner, yeah. right, which is which is key to, key to everybody. In, in just a minute, Paul is going to, going to transition over to uh, the topic of debriefings, but before we, we move to that, let me just end the timeliness discussion on on, uh, on, on one of the most important issues that seems to come up uh, regularly uh, for clients, and that's the issue of, this, of the timing of your protest when you have a debriefing. And so I'm going to go back now to the G we're talking about the GAO here. When, when, when you have a, a, a required debriefing and you request a debriefing within three days of the award, um, so it's got to be requested within three days, and when you have and it's a required debriefing. So, for example, like FAR Part 15 negotiated procurement. Um, the agency is required to give you a debriefing. In those circumstances, you have the later of uh, 10 days after the award or five days after the debriefing. A lot of times you hear these numbers out there, you know, oh, is, is a protest 10 days or five days? Uh, you, and, and, and there's some confusion surrounding that. Um, remember this, you always have 10 days. The government can never reduce your, your, your time to protest the GAO to less than 10 days for a post-award protest. So once you find out that you did not win that contract, at a minimum you will have 10 days. Um, so for example, on, uh, on day one you're, you, you are notified of the award. If on day three the agency provides the debriefing, uh, that does not mean you have to file the protest five days later on day eight. You still have until day 10. You, they can't shorten your time. You always have at least 10 days. But what, what would typically happen is the award is, is, is provided on day one, and then your debriefing is provided on day eight, and then you would have until uh, day 13 to file the protest, essentially. Um, so, and, and where that get, where that gets a little complicated is where the government gives you the debriefing near the end of your 10-day period at the end of a week, because you know one of the things that is built into the GAOs how the GAO handles these protests is they reserve for themselves a full day to notify the agency to handle the stay. So if you got a debriefing on Thursday or let's say a Wednesday, you know, the fifth day is going to fall on a Sunday. And, you know, and you need to get it a day early so that the, the GAO can make the notice to the agency. So once you get outside that 10 days because of the when the first offer debriefing occurs, you know, you may have actually less time than you think, depending on yeah. when, the, when the debrief falls and the requirement that the, the GAO give the agency a day's notice. And, you know, and, and again, to James's earlier point, you should, you should be thinking about 
whether you're going to file a protest or not before you get the disappointed offer or notice. Certainly, you know, when, you, when you're on that 10-day clock, you really need to think long and hard about it. You need to get counsel because you're going to want to do a lot of the preparatory work prior to when you could potentially get crunched on time because of the debriefing, you know, where you have your outside counsel trying to put something together in, in 24 hours because it's really important. And we rely heavily on your technical teams, your cost teams, your management teams to give us the, the detailed information that we need to put into a protest. I mean, certainly we can read the solicitation, we can read the cost proposal, but the people that put it together are the ones that know it. They're going to know where the government got the evaluation right or wrong, and then we sort of put the legal arguments about it. But you need to have sufficient time that they can do their best work and, and, and assist the outside counsel with putting the strongest protest grounds available. Yeah, and, and as Paul said, so Paul mentioned the Wednesday debrief, and I think you'll. It, it seem, I don't know, I have empirical data to back this up, but it does seem that that. It, and I, I, I've spoken with agency counsel enough to know that this is actually on their mind. They do plan this. Some of them do, or a lot of them do. They will plan debriefings for a Wednesday um, for the sole purpose of making it difficult for you to protest. And, um, and, and when you think about it, particularly if you've never protested before and you don't have counsel lined up and engaged and ready to go, it, that alone can be a deal breaker because of the, of the, of the short turnaround. And as, as Paul said on that, you know, you, you know, let's say you're dealing with the five-day rule post, uh, post debriefing, you get it on Wednesday. You know, we'll say, you'll hear from us that, yeah, you can file Monday morning, but you really should file Friday afternoon. It, or, uh, so basically 48 hours after the debrief, you've got to be filing this protest. And, and we're going to say that because uh, the, the statute is written in such a way that, that technically the GAO has one full day to notify the agency and trigger the SICA stay, stopping performance. And depending on the, the, the importance of a procurement, especially if you're the incumbent and the transition, if, if you don't get that stay, that, that, that can be uh, devastating for, in terms of your, 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 your objectives of the protest, in terms of the ability to get an effective corrective action. So uh, it, 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 can be, it can be really difficult, but yeah. bottom line is, I mean, that's why, that's why it, it, you know, getting good contractors are thinking about this ahead of time, they're ready to go. Yeah, and, and, you know, to, to James' point, you can go in the morning of, and certainly we've all been put in that position where, you know, we're on the 10th day, the, the fifth day after the debrief, and we'll go in at 9, and then some poor associate gets nominated to call the GAO every hour to see if the stay call's been made. But if it's a significant procurement, if you're the incumbent, you really want to avoid putting yourself in that, that position. So the, the, the pre-planning, the early engagement of counsel, the uh, collection of, of facts from your technical team, your management team, your cost team, those are all going to make things go a lot more smoothly and put your company in the position to, to get the stay because you really do want to maintain the status quo. So one of the things that through this whole process is important is the debriefings, the required debriefings, and these typically these occur under FAR Part 15 uh, procurements. And these are really a, they can be, they're not always, but they can be a good opportunity for your company to get information about how your proposal was evaluated, the strengths, the weaknesses, and what the government may or may not have done uh, how, how they may or may not have evaluated your proposal. Did they actually faithfully follow what was set forth in um, Section M? And you have a couple opportunities for debriefing. Certainly, you're entitled to a pre-award uh, uh, debriefing. And in both cases, you know, the debriefing request has to go in three days. It doesn't need to be anything formal. You don't need a formal letter. You don't need a letter from your attorney. You know, most of the times the request is just an email that somebody from the company sends over to the uh, the CO. Now, if you if it's a pre-award, if you're eliminated from the competitive range and you're getting a pre-award debriefing, you're not going to get the same amount of information or the same type of information you'll get out of a post-award debriefing. Um, you're going it, to it's relatively limited. The agency's going to tell you their, about their evaluation of significant elements of your company's proposal, a summary of the rationale for why you were eliminated from the competitive range, 
and some reasonable response to relevant questions. Again, the questions that the government's going to answer, the quality of the responses, it's, it's all over the map. And I know that that's a huge area of frustration for, um, for contractors. Um, you don't have the same requirement for the timing. It has to be as soon as reasonably practical. And uh, it could be refused for compelling circumstances. And we do see situations where people are eliminated from the competitive range. They ask for a debriefing, and the government tells them that they're going to delay the debriefing until after award. Now, so, you, you know, if, if the CO says they're not going to give you a pre-award debriefing, they're going to give you just a post-award debriefing, that's good because it's not going to impact your ability to, to file a bid protest because it was the government's decision. If, however, you decline a pre-award debriefing or you ask to delay it, it could impact, it's going to impact the, uh, your ability to file a protest on, on, on issues. So if you're offered, you, you, if you're offered a pre-award debriefing, you want to take it, or you want to be in a situation where the CO um, refuses to, to provide it. Sorry about that. And post-award debriefings, again, this has to, the, you have to make the request in writing. Um, you definitely want to try to avoid uh, getting the debriefing scheduled on Monday through Wednesday, but you do have an obligation to, you should accept the first offered debriefing date because that's what the clock, the five-day clock is going to go off of. So, you know, in, unless there are exceptional circumstances, you need to take the first offered debriefing date and make sure that, that, that you get the uh, information. One of the things you need to be aware of is a lot of times agencies will send what looks to be a written debriefing as part of the discussion about when you're going to get your debriefing. You know, arguably you're going to be on the clock when you get that package for the information that's contained in there. And there's also a risk about whether that is your debriefing or not and does it impact your timeliness. We had a situation a couple years ago where the agency had offered a debriefing, but they had also given us a written debriefing at the same time they offered the debriefing. And so we were, weren't sure about the timing. So just out of an abundance of caution, we went off the written debriefing. The agency filed a motion to dismiss saying that it was premature because we hadn't had the face-to-face -face debriefing and the GAO denied the motion to um, dismiss as premature, saying that the government had created this, this uncertainty and they couldn't um, create this confusion and then, and then benefit, benefit from it. James has talked a lot about the, um, the state of performance and the key information, and those issues are set forth on, on, on slide 31. I think a lot of times people walk into a debriefing thinking they're going to get a lot more information than, than what they do, and a lot of clients express disappointment. What needs to be provided at a debriefing is set forth in 15506D, and what the agency should tell you, what it's supposed to tell you under the FAR is about their evaluation of significant weaknesses and deficiencies in your proposal, the overall evaluated cost or price, the technical rating, past performance information, uh, the overall ranking of offers, which is important. And if, if it was done, you want to make sure that you get it because there's nothing worse than having a client come and say, hey, look, you know, I think I was like next in line for award. We need to protest this. I, I know I'm better than the awardee. And then you get the actual agency report and you find out your client's 13th. And so you, that puts you in a really bad position because one of the things you need to show as part of your protest is that you had competitive prejudice. It's very, very tough to be the 13th um, rated offerer and knock out 12 to get to number one. And you know that's going to be that's going to definitely draw a motion to dismiss. <laughs> You're not going to yeah. be able to show show competitive prejudice. Now, what they're not going to do is do a point by point comparison between your proposal and, and the awardee. And you know what you need to be listening for are those areas where it doesn't appear that the government evaluated your proposal in accordance with Section M. You want to look for areas where it appears the government misled you if you had discussions. You want to try to identify areas if there was a relaxation of the specifications. So you really do want to be in a, a fact um, collection mode. 
you know, with debriefing strategies, I always want to try to get an in-person debriefing. I think that it's beneficial to actually have the government people in the room and to be able to look them in the eye and ask questions and see how they're reacting. I mean, a lot of times the contracting officer will talk and give the client a lot of helpful information and the attorney from the agency will realize it and go back and sort of try to recast what the uh, the contracting officer said. Um, you want to prepare questions. You want to submit questions. I think you want to take advantage of that, whether you have an in-person or a written debriefing. You want to ask for documents. The government may not give them to you, but it, it never hurts to ask. And you want to make sure you know when the debriefing is closed, you know, or whether it's continuing to be open, because that can have an impact on timeliness is, is timeliness of your protest. Uh, two, two points on <clears throat> on that in terms of, of keeping the debriefing uh, open. Uh, always request that if, if, there, if you if you want follow up questions, but just make sure they put it in writing. Uh, I would only rely on it for timeliness purposes of a, of a potential future protest. If they put in writing, the debriefing re will remain open until we answer the questions. And something else about the in person request that, that that I think I think Paul, we both get these questions pretty regularly is whether or not you should have outside counsel attend the debrief. And our general view is no, it's, 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 not, uh, it's generally not very helpful. Um, and if, if you have an outside attorney uh, attend the debrief, then the agency will have their counsel present and the contracting officer and whoever else is in the room will be very guarded, more guarded than usual. Mm -hmm. uh, they're gonna assume every question you're asking is, is, is to trap them they're going to feel like they're in a deposition in a way, and it just doesn't it doesn't achieve the overall purpose of a debrief, which is to get as much information as possible. So, um, yeah. So so generally, no. I mean, there are there are some occasions I've attended some debriefing sometimes on on you know, with special circumstances, but just generally, we suggest that you don't you don't do that. Yeah. I mean, if you've never had a bid protest or you know, you haven't had a lot of debriefings, maybe you do want to have an attorney go just because of their experience. What we typically do and what our involvement is, we have a, a template that we've developed over the years that sets forth the areas that people should ask questions about and the types of questions, and then you tailor it to Section L and Section M. And if you develop your questions and follow them, you should get pretty good answers. Now, what you need to be prepared to do and what you need to identify on part of your debriefing team is identify the person who can ask good follow-up questions. You know, I've been in debriefings where the, the contracting person was uncomfortable asking questions in the first instance, and they were certainly uncomfortable in asking follow-up questions. And there are questions that you do need to, uh, to, to, to probe a little bit more deeply. You know, the overall debriefing strategy, you want to ask in-depth questions. I always like to ask more open-ended questions at the beginning, get the people comfortable talking, and then ask more specific questions. You want to give the appearance that you're there to learn, you're there to improve, you're there to figure out what you could do better to compete more effectively in the future. You really do want to watch uh, for visual cues. You need to have a designated scribe whose job is to do nothing else but take good notes. And as James mentioned, you know, it, it's not our recommendation that attorneys typically participate except in exceptional circumstances. Paul mentioned the visual cues. One of the ones that, 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 that I've seen sometimes is when, is when you ask a question in a debrief uh, and there's no answer, but you just get the eyes. You know, the government, you know, contract officer will look over at someone else and there's sort of this exchange of looks and looks and silence. When you ask a question about, you know, did the awardee do X, Y, Z? Right. Did their proposal contain this? And there's just this... Or were you aware that the awardee has this awful performance record, mm -hmm. you know, and this sort of look, and it, there's a little bit of a panic, and no words are said, and they won't answer the question, but you've now just picked up a really important signal that they, they may be vulnerable in those areas. Yeah, and a lot of times, too, they'll look at their attorney. Like, you'll see the contracting yeah. officer or whoever's giving the briefing, they'll look at their attorney like, okay, what, do I say? <laughs> what should I say? Um, with apologies to David Letterman, uh, they're not nearly as funny but we do have the top 10 questions to ask as part of your debriefing. And, you know, you really do want to get a sense of how your proposal was evaluated. You want to identify those areas where you think the government's evaluation was wrong. You know, how did the government factor in advantages? What did they see as disadvantages? Um, 
How do they evaluate past performance? Are there things that you thought were really good features of your proposal that they didn't consider? So you need to ask, you know, how, if in any way, did it factor into the uh, the award decision? You know, what were the best value um, discriminators? You know, after the debriefing's over, you do need to have a strategy to capture the information because it's going to be critical to preparing your your, your protest. Uh, you need to document your impressions while they're fresh. Um, you need to identify those aspects of your proposal that you think the agency failed to understand or consider. If you identify any irregularities in how the government applied the criteria in Section M, certainly you want to get those captured. If there's any evidence that you were treated differently than the awardee, you want to document that. Uh, did the awardee take any exception to the solicitation requirements? Are you aware of any potential organizational conflicts of interest based on what the awardee is doing? And then the other thing that we're seeing a lot is is um, people are, are are mining the internet to dig up uh, unflattering information about contractors and then trying to attack the past performance evaluation. And there are some companies that. I think in every protest that, that James and I have handled, the company, no matter who the awardee is, must spend three days on the internet trying to find every <laughs> unflattering article, every unflattering court case that they can, and then ultimately it makes its way into their protest to talk about the government's past performance evaluation. And by and large, it, it doesn't work, but it's certainly a strategy that we see frequently. And um, if there are things that are out there that are uh, that, that paint your company in a bad light, you need to disclose those up front so that counsel be, can be prepared to uh, to talk to them. So here's some. It's really important as you're preparing for a protest that you have a team concept. And slide 38 talks about some of the internal corporate questions you need to ask. And, you know, you need to understand, you know, were you misled? Were there things about the discussions that that we ended up doing because we thought the government wanted something? Um, you know, do we think the trade-off, the best value decision, the cost technical trade-off is adequately documented? Uh, if, if the government had committed these flaws, you know, would you have stood a substantial chance for award? And, um, you know, these are just things that you just need to talk about internally or not. And then, so after the debriefing, you know, this is really at the point where you're probably going to make the, the go, no-go decision on whether to protest or not. And James is going to talk a little bit about sort of deciding to protest and, and, and where you go. And and after you, you, you've received your debriefing or, um, or you know, and, and you, may, you may consider it to be entirely unhelpful. Oftentimes they are unhelpful. And uh, a common question is always, can we protest that or can we object to that? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, with debriefings, that's just an area where, where there are rules in place of what the agency should do, and including how, how, how uh, quickly they should provide the debriefing to what information they should give you. But if they don't give you that information, you really don't have a, a there, there's no there's no protest ground for that. So um, the GAO, for example, will not consider a, an objection to the scope of a debriefing. So um, this is why, in terms of just basically the out the strategy that, that Paul just talked about, it's that, that's why that's important. You want to try, you want to go in there to try to get that information. Um, but once you have that information, and once you have, you know, at least hopefully enough to to figure out whether you you think that there is a problem. Um, in the procurement and the source selection process, in the award selection, or the or the evaluation of your own proposal, this is a time where you have to make that decision. Do we want to protest? And I think two two broad areas that you that you have to think about, and, and I know Paul's touched on on the first one, standing. Do you have? Uh, can you show prejudice? Um, is there is there injury to you um, uh, based on what you think went wrong? So. Uh, any action, whether it's the GAO or the court, you've got to show prejudice. And, and the GAO's definition is you have to be an interested party, um, which means an actual prospective bidder who was, whose direct economic interest was affected by the award or failure to award the contract. Um, and, and it says direct economic interest. Uh, direct means it's got to be pretty close. So if you're number 13 in line for award, 
generally that's not direct. If you're number two in line for award or next in line for award, probably is, um, or in fact it would be. So, so uh, rankings can can matter. Now, uh, I think in LPTA procurements, those rankings are, are a little more clear because it's it's lowest price technically acceptable. So, if you are the the 13th most expensive proposal. Um, that would be very difficult. You would have to be careful and, and really think through how you could argue prejudice in that case. Um, best value procurements tend to be a little easier, um, certainly at the, at the pleading stage of a protest, because you're challenging a subjective decision where there's actually trade-offs. So you're making some argument that your technical merit was worth your higher price, um, if, if those are the facts. But in, in thinking about the protest, you have to look at the, the technical scores of the awardee and their price, and can you present a, a, a protest that that if you if the errors are corrected the way you say they should be, does that place you in that zone of of, of representing the likely best value? I mean, you don't have to prove it; it's not your decision; it's still the agency's decision who's going to be the best value. But um, if if the awardee has a has an outstanding technical score. And you have a marginal, um, and you have a higher price than the awardee. Well, that means you're not going to change the price. So you, if you, if you protest and say, "Well, my marginal should have been a good rating," well, okay, maybe that's true, but a good is still less than outstanding, and the awardee had a lower price. So why would you protest? That should that should be a deal breaker for you. Um, and, and frankly, if we had, if we saw those facts. Even if you had some basis to show that you that you that you should have received an outstanding, which would be a very difficult argument to make and, and, and to succeed on, even then you're talking about essentially a tie. It would be very difficult to ever imagine how a scenario where that would actually play out, where you would represent the best value. So that's 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 a that, these are sort of threshold considerations you got to think about. Um, and then of course the, the the actual technical merit. I mean, think about um, you know, the the <laughs> it, it sounds like a basic question, but do you have legitimate protest grounds? Um, was there an actual impropriety in what the agency did? And um, that may seem seem like a terribly obvious question, but a lot of times contractors will, um, I say, frequently driven by on the business development side of, of the of the company, where where you feel that the process was unfair to you and your proposal, um, which may be true, but if 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 the grounds of protest you you think or, or that you're that you're considering, if they're if they're if they're not likely to result in any sort of uh, success for the company, um, you, you you probably should not protest. Well, I think I think one of the areas that we see people get in trouble all the time is, you know, the the business development people are talking to the program people, and the program people are like, oh my God, you should have won, you should have won. We don't know what the solicitation shop did. You guys are great. We really want to work with you. And they get everybody within the corporation all spun up to file a protest, thinking that the program shop is going to stand shoulder to shoulder with you if you file the protest, and then the program shop disappears, right? Because it's ultimately the solicitation shop's responsibility, and you know, I, I can think of three or four where the client has, has decided to file a protest despite our advice because people were getting insight from the agency that the program shop was so upset that they didn't get the contract. So, I mean, it's just, it's just you need to be careful of that trap, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think I think some of the strategic business considerations, uh, and, and we've listed a few questions that, that – should go through your mind. What are you really trying to accomplish here? What's the remedy that you think that you can can obtain? Most most remedies in a post a post award protest are going to be a reevaluation. Uh, the GAO or the court it would would rarely direct an award itself, as Paul mentioned earlier. That's just not common. But but the vast majority of time, and, and when you see these the, the statistics of a, of a corrective of, of of some sort of corrective action or effectiveness of a protest. Generally, that's a reevaluation. The agency goes back and 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 fixes their flawed evaluation or makes a new best value decision. Um, um, think about the fact that you know, is this a must-win contract? That 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 oftentimes affects the, the the decision-making process. If it's a really important contract, maybe it's worth filing in protest. Um, is the procurement uh, a massive 
and long-term IDIQ contract that, that if you don't get on this vehicle, you're going to be shut out of this business opportunity for, for 10 years. Um, I had a, a, a um, was involved in, in a protest a few years ago that ended up having, we had five protests, both pre-award and post-award, at, and both the GAO and Court of Federal Claims, so five separate actions over a two-and-a-half-year period. Um, it, but, it, but it involved a 15-year contract uh, with the GSA. And, and, and that, that, that's a classic case where that's a deal breaker. If you're not, if you're not in that, you're done for 15 years. Um, and, and companies are shutting down that whole division. So, uh, and that one eventually resulted in an award to the client. So it, it, was, it was well worth the effort. But um, that goes into your, your, your thought process. Um, um, you know, what, I think one of the, the topics that, that uh, is discussed frequently, you know, are you an incumbent that certainly um, goes into the into the decision making process. If you're the incumbent uh, and you're likely to get an extension of the contract, that can uh, defray or even offset the costs of, of protesting. That makes the decision easier, and um, and it's certainly a, a, a strategic consideration. Um, I, I would I would challenge companies to think about whether the 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 perceived flaw. In, in the evaluation is one that, if corrected, would still um, you, you still you still win the contract. And and I know that that sort of overlaps with the with the prejudice issue. But um, sometimes you will see pretty clear errors in in a procurement. I mean that that are that are just objectively wrong. The agency made a mistake. They made a factual mistake in in, in attributing something to your proposal that wasn't in your proposal. And and those are those are. Those can excite you because you think, oh, well, we've got a great protest here. But think about the big picture. Even if you correct that, you protest, you, you, you file a great protest, it convinces everyone, the government goes back and fixes the record. But it, are, are they going to fix the award? I mean, that's really the thing. I mean, is, is this likely to change the award or at least compel the, the technical evaluation team, the source selection panel, to really um, – you know, think about their their decision or rethink their decision. Um, and then and another common consideration is is you know, kind of use this term or this phrase loosely, you know, sort of sending a message to the agency. Um, that th- this comes up uh, frequently when when you're in a, pro- a potential protest situation where this is not the first time you've dealt with a problem. You've seen an agency do this to you before, and maybe you've been quiet two or three or four times, uh, or maybe you expect that this is going to happen in the future. And at some point, you just decide, we need to call the agency out for what they're doing. We need to challenge it, even if we think we're likely to lose um, or, or that you know, the chances of success are small. Uh, but what they're doing is unfair. And we want, we want the agency to know that we're not going to sit back on every future procurement and not, um, and not take action. And, that, and so sometimes protests can, can be a way of, of, of holding the government accountable and and, and, and sort of getting them in line for future procurements um, that you may have. Um, we we have on on slide 42 a, a just a, a an excerpt from the GAO's annual report to Congress from last year. The, the GAO does this every year where they where they highlight uh, the most prevalent reasons for sustaining protests, and they list uh, four of them there: unreasonable technical evaluation, unreasonable past performance evaluation, unreasonable cost and price. Eval and a flawed selection decision. Now, honestly, I don't think those are the most helpful in terms of in terms of uh, describing exactly what those grounds. Because that, that, to me, it's, that largely covers everything. <laughs> um, you know, so they're, they're so vague, but um, that kind of gives you a sense. And so, uh, what I've in the, next, the following slides, we sort of talked about some of the ones that are, from our perspective, are are, are the, the the better protest grounds, the one that ones that tend to work. Um, you know, failure to follow solicitation ground rules, uh, failure to document the record, unequal treatment, uh, clear factual errors, math errors, um, violations of law. I always call these the objective grounds versus the subjective grounds. Um, when you when you can point to something very specific, where Section M of the RP tells you that the agency has to consider these three things and they did not. That's a great ground of protest because you you are you can objectively tell the GAO or the Court of Federal Claims that that the agency did not follow 
the ground rules of the competition. And the reason these tend to be more effective or more successful is because you're not asking the judge or the, the, the GAO attorney deciding the protest to, to make a judgment call. That judge or attorney is not deciding whose proposal has more merit. They're not deciding whether your proposal is, is worth more value to the agency. Those are classic deci subjective decisions that are, that are really largely committed to agency discretion. Uh, but if you can point out and point the GAO to, to a, a written rule that says that the agency is going to do A, B, C, and they only did A and B, but not C, that's a, that's a great argument. Um, um, unequal treatment is, is another one, again, just because of the, 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 the objective nature of that. Um, frequently, that, we see unequal treatment uh, grounds develop in supplemental protests once you get access to the other uh, awardee's proposal, because then you can have the proposal side by side, and you can see uh, under protective order. So unfortunately, the, you know, our clients and the companies can't actually see this, but, but outside counsel can review the proposal of the awardee, compare it to yours, and and validate the evaluation. See where, uh, you know, sometimes agency evaluators uh, give an awardee all sorts of credit for, for, for proposing these wonderful features. And, and then we look at your proposal and we find out that you have the same thing, but you receive no credit. So that's a, that's a classic ground. Um, um, some of the less successful grounds, I talked about the subjective agency judgment. Um, this is not to say that these grounds don't succeed. They can succeed and they, they have succeeded, but they just they, they generally are, are not as successful. They're more difficult. And um, you know, when you're thinking about protesting, if if these are the only grounds you have, um, uh, you know, that, that, that can that can weigh against maybe a decision going forward. Of course, having said that, um, all all cases are fact specific. So for example, we you know talk about um, individual ratings. Um, it can be difficult to say that your that your a good proposal should be outstanding. It's hard, it's very hard to convince a GAO attorney that that an agency's judgment that this proposal is good and not outstanding is going to is going to is going to justify a, a sustained decision. Um, Trade-off decisions are hard to challenge, but again, it depends on what the numbers are. I mean, if 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 your uh, proposal is 50% lower price and your and the technical appears to be essentially equal, well, then, yeah, I would say that that's a much stronger ground um, of protest. But generally speaking, you know, if, 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 the, if the proposals are close in technical or price, um, and, of course, depending on what the evaluation scheme says, if, if price is more important or significantly more important um, than technical, you gotta, you got to consider that as well. But but, but generally, trade-offs are going to be difficult to challenge. Well, the other thing, too, is, you know, as you're, like, formulating your strategy and looking at your, your what legal theories you're going to proceed on, you have to have an understanding of to what you actually need as a, as a, as a offer of work. Because let's say that, you know, you just blew the proposal and you essentially need a mulligan, mm -hmm. a do-over. Some of these arguments aren't going to aren't going to get you there. If you're going to try to get a do-over, you probably need like lack of meaningful discussions or relaxation of requirements or something like that that can get you to get you where you need to be to submit a new proposal. But if you're just if you need a new proposal, but the only grounds you have are are going to get you a reeval, that's probably not a good protest to file. Yeah. It's just just a waste of money, I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Um, so, so I think those are that's that, that's sort of a, that re, kind of recaps the, the, the decision making process when you when you're when you're presented with a, a, a potential protest decision. I, I want to touch briefly before we, we move on to the important topic of intervention, which should not be overlooked. Um, but we have just a couple slides on on task and delivery order uh, uh, protests and. Uh, you should be familiar, if you're not already, with with some of the quirky rules that apply to task and delivery orders. Uh, and to clarify, this does not refer to GS, uh, GSA federal supply schedule orders, although we talk about those as being task and delivery orders, and they're not FAR Part 16 task orders. So uh, this does not apply to GSA federal supply schedule. Um, but when you're talking about a, a, an order against an IDIQ vehicle, um, there are there are pretty 
pretty strict, and, well, absolutely strict and, and severe uh, restrictions on, on the ability to protest. Um, right now, at, if it's a civilian agency, IDIQ vehicle, um, you, uh, the, the, the procurement or the task order has to be valued in excess of $10 million. If it's DOD, the, that was recently moved up to $25 million. So you've got a $20 million Navy order that you think uh, you know, the Navy violated the law, you can't protest. You cannot go to GAO. You can't go to the Court of Federal Claims. Um, you can't protest that. So that's 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 a, a problem, and, and, and you know you, it, it can be very frustrating, particularly when you see pretty pretty blatant errors. Um, um, and, and this applies both both post award and pre award. If it's a solicitation uh, for a a twenty million dollar DoD. Uh, uh, procure or to order um, that's going to be against a, an IDIQ vehicle, um, and it, it's essentially a brand name contract. It restricts competition, um, and maybe you would say blatantly violates uh, the competition laws of SECA. You can't protest that. So um, keep that in mind when you're when you're looking at uh, your procurements, and you should, you should, this really should be in the back of your mind before you even I mean, long before you get the award. Um, however. Paul mentioned up at the very beginning, and this is this is something that 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 uh, it's worth noting. There is a task and delivery order ombudsman option. It's not it's not technically a protest; it's a complaint. Um, but you you can it, it it is a it is a process that exists where you can file an objection letter, a complaint letter to the ombudsman that would look like a protest that complains about what happened, and uh, and it's it's less effective. There's no process right, so there's no there's no timeline in terms of when you get a decision or if you ever get a decision. There's no there's no record. There's there's nothing. It's you file the letter, it goes into a black hole, and you hope you get a response. Um, we've had plenty where there's just no result. We've also had cases where the ombudsman writes a letter back within a month and takes corrective action. So they can work. I mean, which is why I wanted to make sure we we pointed these out. So even though there is a jurisdictional bar on on uh, on a lot of these task order uh, procurements that are worth worth a lot, uh, you know, nine, uh, nine million or, or twenty four million, depending on the agency, um, you still have that option. So, yeah, I, mean, I think our most recent experience was though that like we we you didn't get your calls returned. No, we never got no. a letter. It was just yeah, <laughs> and and <laughs> like thanks for caring. <laughs> right. The ombudsman they know that because. Well, again, what are you going to do if they don't return your call? If they don't respond, there's no legal mechanism to compel them to take right. action. So, when you don't have that process right, an agency, it's yeah, that, that 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 official can really do what he or she wants to yeah. do. It, it is frustrating. So, uh, the next topic we want to talk a little bit about um, is, is, is is intervention, and this really applies to the awardee whose um, whose contract is being protested by a disappointed offer. And I, and I know that a lot of companies decide not to intervene because they're worried about the time and expense associated with it. But, you know, I think companies need to understand that there is some utility in, in intervening and that just because you intervene doesn't mean that you have to spend a significant amount of money. Uh, on slide 50, I talk about really the two types of intervention. There's like an intervention light and then an active intervention. And really the intervention light is having somebody that's able to get under the protective order that can monitor the protest and more importantly, ensure that none of your proprietary data is making it outside the protective order. Because as the government and the protester are negotiating about what should be redacted or not redacted, if you don't intervene, you don't have any – certainly the protester is not going to be acting in your interest, but you don't have any guarantee that the things that you would consider to be proprietary are going to match what the government considers to be proprietary. So there is some risk that your proprietary information can um, – could make it out in, into the public or be provided to a competitor, which may hurt you on, on future procurements. Um, you know, you should have a, a conversation with operations about whether it makes sense to intervene or not. 
but I think by and large it's 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 a good decision. And, and some of the things that intervention helps with is it gives you an advocate to the agency. You know, a lot of times what James and I do when we intervene on behalf of a client, I mean, the first call we make is to agency counsel. And, you know, the first thing we tell them is that they got the award decision right, the client wants us to stand shoulder to shoulder with them, provide any support that we can through the process. And I think we've had a lot of success in developing a, a very good rapport with agency counsel. And, and in some instances, I know James had a case where it looked as if the agency was going to take corrective action, but because he'd intervened and developed a good rapport with the agency counsel, he was able to convince them to stand firm and not take corrective action, and ultimately the protest, protest was denied. The other advantage is that having somebody intervene, an outside counsel intervene, it can help shape corrective action. Because if the if you're if you're an awardee and the government's going to take corrective action, you really want to try to limit it. You don't want to have entirely new final proposal submissions. Maybe you can convince the agency to just correct the past performance volume or the technical volume, but not get not let the disappointed offeror submit a new cost volume. Because right now, they after the uh, award decision is made, they know what price they're shooting at. And so it can put you at a competitive disadvantage if the government takes a, um, a, uh, uh, a broader corrective action. Uh, outside counsel can help limit the record. We do that a lot, talking to agencies about what they do need to do need should or should not um, approach. You can you can advance arguments that the government may not be willing to make. I mean, there are a lot of times you talk to government counsel about making a particular argument. They're uncomfortable with it but you think it's a good argument, and by intervening, you get to make it. It gives the government a different perspective on the procurement. Uh, I'd already mentioned protecting uh, proprietary information, and you can also gather information and, uh, you know, get a good sense of what the government's needs are. You know, they may need assistance with you know, research or, or something, and by intervening, you're able to, um, to, help, to help them. There's some of the other, uh, the participation, you know, by intervening, prepare comments, you can help on supplemental grounds, um, you know, you'll have the ability to review the agency report or administrative record and identify any issues that, that may be out there. Uh, if you don't intervene, you're not going to have that insight into the record, so at the end of 100 days, you may get surprised or you may be surprised to learn that the government took corrective action, so I think that it's important to to have a um, seat at the table. The other thing is a lot of times we're able to prevail upon the agency to draft a request for a summary dismissal. I know we've had instances where we've written them because we were going to file them, but then the agency thought it would be more effective coming from them, and so they go ahead and file it. And, and by and large, I think that's the right judgment. Yeah. You know, I think the GAO has a tendency to to give the agency's pleadings a little bit more weight than the, the interveners. I don't know if you have a different. Yeah, no, I, I, on that point, I, I, I agree. And, and, and for those of you who have not intervened or really thought about the process, it, it, it is interesting uh, where, where you as the awardee at, with your outside counsel can essentially provide that you augment the agency's legal uh, support for the, uh, to defend the award. And, and ghostwriting does happen. Uh, some, some agency lawyers don't don't want it, and they just they, 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 they keep some distance. But a lot uh, uh, greatly appreciate the, the added support. And um, and as Paul said, I think agencies or the GAO tends to take an agency pleading more seriously than than the interested awardees pleading. Right. You know, they have more self interest in, in preserving the award, where the agency. Is viewed a little bit more as a, as a, somewhat as more of a neutral mm -hmm. in um, in just conducting the overall procurement. So, when, you know, we'll draft language and provide it to agency counsel, and they will put they will literally put it in there on their letterhead um, and sign it as their own document. So that that, that that's an effective tool um, for the intervener. Yeah, and you know, we've also had instances where the agency counsel just wants to bounce ideas off of you. We had a, a protest where we were representing the intervener in a Navy procurement, and we'd get calls from the agency counsel all the time, like, hey, look, I'd like to run an idea by you. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? So it is a really good um, 
opportunity to help their thinking, to give them somebody to bounce ideas off of, to um, discourage them from taking like unreasonable positions or misstating the law. So there's a lot of benefits. And, and most of you, and your outside counsel should be able to work with you on sort of how much effort do you actually want them to expend. You know, like you don't have to go all in. You can, there are lesser forms of activity that can protect your interests. Yeah, it, it, and, I, and I would really emphasize this one point on intervention that um, had a number of experiences, including one one very recently where where the intervention may not have been active. We didn't we didn't we didn't uh, draft extensive pleadings. It was more of just a, of that show of support um, that that we talked about. But the the value of getting on the phone with the agency attorney in terms of just developing the relationship, we as outside counsel become your advocate. Um, and a voice for you as a contractor. And, and, and I've had lengthy conversations with um, uh, an agency office um, because we're on the same side. So they, they, you know, they view us as allies and, 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 uh, and we, you know, we talk through the issues. We, we can develop just a really good rapport. We'll joke with, with them and just get to know them well. And I tell you, that, that can be invaluable. And, and, it, and it provides us an opportunity to, to tell the agency lawyer who is deeply involved with the procurement, working with the contracting officer and the rest of the technical evaluators, how much it means that, that the agency selected our client for award, how much the client cares about this procurement and is looking forward to proceeding. And so even in the situations when there is a, a corrective action, because you know maybe the facts just require it, There's, there was an error, nothing you can do about it, they gotta go back and do some reevaluation. But we've now, by intervening, we, we've developed that relationship. We've had those personal conversations, and I, you know, there's no way to put a put a dollar figure on on that value. But I, I can say just from from going through that, it, it it can it can do a lot. So, if for no if for no other reason, I think it's it's, it's worth just having that that um, just that presence and and yeah. help develop that relationship. No, I, I agree. I totally agree. Um, we got about um, nine minutes left, and we have some lessons learned here at the end that. Um, you know, we've sort of collected and, and gathered over the years based on our experience with our clients and what we've seen at the, the GAO. Um, those lessons learned are summarized up on, on page 56, but I think, you know, one of the important ones is that as a business, you really do need to maximize your pre-proposal marketing opportunities. Uh, I think it's important if you're providing innovative technologies. I think it's very important if you are uh, trying to get in front of a new agency. I mean, some agencies are easier to get into than others. There are some agencies like, oh, I don't know, the CIA or the NSA. They sort of have their their contractors, and it's just a really tough market to get into. So you really do need to make the outreach and, and show them you know how you can make them look good and make their life make their life easier. Uh, you know, as you're going through the um, the solicitation, you really do need to look at, at Section M, and you really do need to write to Section M. I think a lot of companies, specifically, I think in particular incumbents, they tend to write their proposal to what they're seeing on the ground and what they think the agency needs rather than what their proposal is going to be evaluated against by the procurement shop and the technical team. Mm -hmm. And they're shocked as, as heck when they don't win. Um, I also think that you know incumbents run the risk of, of, of drinking their own bathwater. I mean, certainly James and I have had a number of recent protests where Basically, the only complaint, legitimate complaint, the protester has is that, you know, we're the incumbent and we're really good. So how could you love anybody better than us? Because, you know, we're the most lovable contractor in the world. And it, it's dangerous that when you fall into that trap. And so I do think that as part of your proposal team, you sort of need that doubting Thomas or that person that's going to look and ensure that, you have addressed the issues that are that are set forth in, in Section M. And again, you know, if there are ambiguities in Section M about how you're going to be evaluated, if there are ambiguities in, in what the government's instructions are, 
you really should try to clarify those because you don't want to try to justify them after the fact. I think it's very important to uh, to understand, you know, what the rules of the road are going in. And, you know, if, you, if it's really egregious, then, yeah, perhaps think about a GAO protest. But if it's not, use the question and answer process and think about an agency-level protest. I don't get the sense that, in, at least based on my experience, James may have, may have a different experience, but I don't think that the agencies are as offended by an agency level protest as they are a GAO protest. Yeah. They seem to be a little bit more open to that and and if it's legitimate, I mean they I think I think they appreciate it in some ways. Now I would go in earlier, right, if I identify the problem rather than later because they're not going to want the procurement delayed, but that makes it incumbent upon the uh, the offeror to really scrutinize section M. And certainly if you have if you get a draft RFP Take the time to look through that carefully and provide your comments so that you're shaping the proposal all along. I think that uh, you know you can wait you can wait too long. Um, the proposal details. You, you, I guess it's surprising how many times people don't submit key information. I mean, you see a number of cases where people don't identify key personnel or they don't submit resumes or letters of commitment. I mean, those are all easy mistakes that should be avoided. But you know, even sophisticated contractors. You know, continue to, um, to, to 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 make those. I think the other thing is that you really do have to consider the fiscal environment. Um, I mean, some of the proposals that we've seen, uh, as they compare to the independent government cost estimates or the prices of the incumbents, I mean, people are are, are slashing their costs to get to get awards, and so you really do need to understand that. The government's looking for value. They're looking for low price, low cost. And, and sometimes, candidly, it appears that even though it's a best value procurement, the way the government's conducted it, it's essentially an LPTA procurement. They found the lowest price, and then they sort of back into the evaluation to um, support support the award decision. You know, we see issues like about this all the time when considering which corporate entity will submit the proposal. You know, how can you use the past performance? Um, you know, if you're going to use the past performance of an affiliate or a subsidiary, you better make sure that, <laughs> that they're doing something on the proposal. I mean, a lot of times you'll have an entity proposed by itself, and the affiliate or subsidiary has absolutely no role in performance, but that's the only past performance they submit because, you know, it, it's more impressive than of the individual entity. Uh, with regard to subcontractors, you know, the general rule is that unless it's excluded, it, it's included. But, you know, you really do need to scrutinize Section M and see how you need to structure your past performance offering to, um, um, to, to maximize, maximize your, uh, your score. And, you know, with regard to the, the past performance, I mean, typically in just about every evaluation you, you see, it's going to be similar scope size and complexity and so you really do need to take that seriously and try to track those past performance references to what's going to be done here because that's an area where it's frequently attacked that a contract you know this is a, a 500 million dollar contract and all your contracts are 50 million well okay how are we making the size scope and complexity requirements so you really do need to um, to scrutinize scrutinize though scrutinize those. You want to make, if you have discussions, you know, make effective use of those. A lot of times there's no limits on, on what you can say. You don't have the page limitation like you do in the proposal. So you need to avail yourself of those opportunities. Um, you know, don't simply reference citations to the proposal. You really do need to take the discussion issues seriously and, and fully articulate your response. Uh, it's not helpful to say, see, see proposal section X, and that be your response. I mean, obviously, the technical evaluation team had already looked at that part of your proposal, and having reviewed it, they still have questions. So you really do need to uh, to uh, amplify that. It sounds silly and probably trite, but you know what? Neatness counts. And... Uh, you know, we see people get marked down all the time because their proposals are, are sloppy and it, it, it causes a, a concern with the agency. So we are at the 
1.30 mark. Uh, I appreciate all of you, and James appreciates all of you participating today and listening to our webinar. Next month's webinar on September 20th, 2017 is entitled GSA Audits from Anxiety to Zen, which I don't know that Zen-like existence and GSA should ever be used together, so I'm definitely